L'habitatge és un dret. Un dret que està en joc. A les desafiaments més durs s'estan duent a Barcelona. I Barcelona li està plantant cara. Amb tota mena de solucions. El món ens està mirant. Hola, bon dia, benvingudes i benvinguts. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the European Network for Housing Research Conference 2022. Thank you all for joining us today, coming from different places from Europe and the world. Just to have an idea, who's a local? Let me see your hands. Oh, wow. And who is coming from different places, from other places in the world? Wow, that's impressive. Okay, that explains your punctuality, which is great, and it's not that common here. But let's see what happens on Friday afternoon. Maybe you have acquired a, a more Spanish or Catalan vibe by then. But, but no, let's keep it that way because it's great for the Congress. Anyway, uh, thank you for joining us today and also for the next two days of discussions, workshops, and all kinds of activities on housing in current times. I'm Nuria Moliner, I'm an architect, researcher, and communicator, and based in Barcelona, in fact, and I'll be more than glad to host this event for you, because I'm, I strongly believe that these topics are extremely necessary, relevant, and is interesting today, and also because I'm a researcher myself on innovative urbanism and architecture with a environmental and social approach, so I honestly can wait to listen to your thoughts and ideas about these topics. Today we start the 34th edition of the European Network for Housing Research Conference. Am I saying it right? Is it the 34th edition? Yeah, because I counted them all online, but I just wanted to make sure. So this is the 34th, no? 34th, right? Yeah, that's, okay, great. <laughs> and, okay, I have another question for you. Does anybody know when this network started, when it all started? Which year? 88. The European Network for Housing Research was first established back in 1988, when I wasn't even born yet. So imagine, it's, it was a pretty long time ago, but not that a long time ago. Uh, but it's still powerful because during all these years, we have always provided a platform for everyone engaged in housing research. They have gone to Amsterdam, Reykjavik, Paris, Lisbon, Glasgow, Oslo, Istanbul, Prague, and many more cities. Do you remember any other cities where the conference has been held? Also in Catalonia, Tarragona, right, a few years ago? They have organized a major conference each year in a different city along all these years. And today, it's time for Barcelona. By the way, welcome to Barcelona. Welcome to this typical sunny day. Uh, I know it's not that convenient, but we needed a rainy day, so that's a good thing. Let's hope it's not raining tomorrow for the field trips, and apparently it's not going to rain, so we're gonna be fine. Um, unfortunately, Barcelona is precisely one of those cities where the toughest challenges are taking place. The situation of the housing market in Barcelona gives a very clear picture of the contradiction of the current process of globalization and some of the worst consequences of capitalism. A storm of internal and external forces are putting pressure to the city and therefore also to its citizens and showing the limited capacity of governments to cope with the housing crisis and problems such as real estate speculation or gentrification. The thing is that the right to housing is at stake. Housing, this basic human right, is at stake. And many of us, especially the youngest ones and the most vulnerable ones, are severely suffering. Suffering from frustration or even 
nihilism in a world where, where we can even afford a worthy place to live in, in a world in environmental and social collapse that leads us to an uncertain future. We see it every single day on the news, on our day-to-day -day lives. We live in times of unprecedented climate breakdown, decay, and upheaval. But because of that, now more than ever, we need hope. I don't know how you feel about that because I personally sometimes pretty often feel eco anxiety and I feel sad when I look around and, this, and see the world we have created with so many social inequalities. But the more our reality becomes a dystopia, the more I need to believe in utopias, the more I need to believe that an utopia is real and possible, the more we need visionary and bold ideas that face current and future challenges and create a better and more hopeful horizon for everyone. As researchers, you, you might agree with me that concepts are really powerful. They, they shape our society and the world we inhabit, and at the same time, they have the capacity to imagine alternative futures that may exist ahead of us. But concepts and ideas, and especially good concepts and good ideas, need to be followed by actions. There's no more time left for us not to take actions on the ecological, ecological and social crisis we are living. And Barcelona and Barcelona City Council are definitely taking action on the housing crisis, for instance, with all kinds of solutions that you saw on the video. Co-housing, there are many cases, so interesting. Maybe you ha we will have time to visit some of them. Affordable housing, eviction prevention, public construction, emergency dwellings, industrialized or prefabricated building systems, rehabilitation, which is a huge topic in Europe, plans against energy, poverty, or control measures for short-term rental platforms, and many more. I'm sure they will explain it better than myself. But this is why I strongly believe, I, I'm 100% positive that Barcelona will be the perfect host of this annual conference, because in a way, we, we could be a role model in that regard, but at the same time, we'll still have a lot of things to do and we're eager to learn and we won't miss the chance to learn from all of you these days in order to keep moving forward. As, as you may know, this year's conference will address the struggle for the right to housing and the pressures of globalization and affordability in cities today. Researchers or not, these questions appeal to each and every one of us, since most of us live in cities, and it is expected that 80% of the worldwide population, more or less, will live in cities by 2050. So it is, our, is, it is time for us to wonder how a metropolis should be, how can we provide and ensure quality of life in those metropolis, and especially to do it in terms of housing, since houses and dwellings are the the molecule, the basic element of the city. And at the end of the day, it is where we spend our lifetimes, where we spend our day-to-day -day lives. And therefore, housing is an essential, intrinsic, and defining part, element of our society. According to David Harvey, and, and surely and hopefully to most of us, our cities cannot be a place to invest, but a place to live. However, the proliferation of real estate for tourism and, above all, the landing of global speculator funds that have acquired large amounts of housing over the last few decades have created a spiraling increase in prices and have gradually expelled large population groups from the places they belong to and forced them to move to more peripheral areas with all the personal, social and economical or ecological impacts and consequences. The counterpart is the emergence of grassroots movements that assert the right to housing and also the right to the city. But as long as we do not tackle the reversal of financialization of cities or the limits of 
tourist and property monoculture as the driving force behind our economic growth by promoting new models contrary to the current capital accumulation dynamic in a few hands. It seems that we will not be fully able to enjoy, to fully enjoy the right to housing, not the right to the city, and it will remain a pipe dream. To prevent this from happening, and through the lens of both young and experienced professionals working on housing research, here we will compare housing policies from different European countries, we will discuss approaches, contrast outcomes, and join forces. And we will do it not only through discussions, debates, presentations, what we call the plenary sessions, but also through workshops, networking sessions, field trips, which I'm sure you will enjoy, and many more. Today, there will be two plenary sessions, two workshops, and a networking session. But before we move on to that, let's start with the welcoming and opening speeches with representatives of the team ENHR, UPC, the Universitat Politécnica of Catalonia, ENHR local committee members, and also Barcelona City Council. To start with, let's welcome on stage Jordi Ros, Vice Rector of the Polytechnic University of Catalonia, la Universitat Politécnica de Catalunya. Quan volis, Jordi, benvingut. Sí. Thank you very much, Nuria. Um, good morning, uh, distinguished uh, authorities, academics, organizers and Congress attendees, and friends, uh, on behalf of the director of the uh, Polytechnic University of Catalonia, uh, Daniel Crespo, welcome to the Architecture School of Barcelona of UPC. As a vice rector of architecture and as a former dean of this uh, school, I'm uh, honored uh, to taking part of this uh, welcome event to the Congress. The Barcelona School of Architecture is about to celebrate its uh, 150th anniversary. A period of time that has run in parallel to the history of collective housing linked to the urban consequences of industrial revolution. Since then, a large number of studies and, and writings uh, have reflected on a subject that uh, goes beyond the specific field of architecture. As a renowned example, uh, Friedrich Engels' The Housing Question turns uh, 150 years old uh, as well. During this uh, last uh, century and a half, architecture schools have also uh, uh, systematically addressed to the housing question, but not always in the most relevant way. As a local example, when I was studying, uh, let's say not so far away, uh, housing was unofficially forbidden as a final project. You could design libraries, museum, hospital, even airports, but not housing. If you wanted to demonstrate your skill as an architect, you had to design relevant and large public facilities. In just over 20 years, this has radically changed. And nowadays, most of the design studios at the ateliers of these schools contain, in one way or another, housing as a topic. The recent creation of a chair of Barcelona Housing Studies and the successful assistance to this Congress are also explaining the current uh, good health of research on housing. I would not like to end uh, this brief intervention without mentioning our partners in this Congress, l'Observatori Metropolità de l'Habitatge de Barcelona, uh, el MUBA, evidentment l'Ajuntament de Barcelona, it's our pleasure to share this uh, academic event with them. 
the organizer uh, have asked us to be very brief. And uh, so I leave at this point, giving you a warm welcome to this important Congress that we have the honor of hosting of this School of Architecture in Barcelona. Enjoy the Congress and enjoy Barcelona. Thank you. Thank you, gracias Jordi, from architect to architect. I know this place is pretty special for you too, and we will talk about that later. And now it's time for Peter Bolhauer, president of ENHR and also professor at TU Delft, whenever you want. Also, uh, thank you, Nadia. And, uh, well, dear friends, uh, on behalf of the uh, Coordination Committee of the European Network uh, for Housing Research, it's, real, uh, it's a real honor for me as a chair to welcome you, um, uh, all the almost, well, let's say, almost 400 participants here at the 34th ANHR Internal Conference in Barcelona. The struggle for the right to housing, the pressure of globalization and affordability in cities today. Well, I think for, for one, uh, then, uh, more than one reason, this is a very special and also unique conference again. Uh, first of all, it's the, our first on-site conference after the COVID pandemic, started at the beginning of uh, 2020. That was our last opportunity, actually, to meet each other physically, physically and it was in Athens in 2019, a long time ago already. It feels like almost a century to me. Well, going to conferences is actually not only about uh, presenting papers and listening to very interesting keynotes, eh? but it's also about meeting people in real life, making new connections and be part of all these uh, social events. Now, luckily, uh, Nadia Sharan Boulas uh, and her team managed to organize an online conference in 2021 in Nicosia. It was very uh, unfortunate that we were not able to, to meet each other live over there. But it was, on the other hand, it was fantastic that we had uh, the possibility to, uh, to have this conference. And also the Nicosia team, they, uh, had, they made a great effort on that. And it was, for us, it was also a novelty for NHR. And we, are, we were very happy that it worked out so well. Uh, and that we have now the possibility to organize conferences even when it's not possible to travel. So yeah, we will use that in the, in the future. The, the knowledge we gained at that conference was already used at the special ANHR COVID conference and also at the successfully new housing conferences in, the, in March uh, this year with a high attendance rate. So we will continue these online conferences, especially for new housing researchers, but of course we will have our annual meetings live. Uh, another advantage of course of these online meetings is that we can uh, cut down our carbon uh, footprint by reducing our flight hours and also contribute to the climate goals. And yeah, to implement that, ANHR also introduced several sustainability measurements. Uh, and this item is on the agenda of the Coordination Committee almost every meeting. And it's also against this background, I think it's praiseworthy that uh, local organizers put a lot of efforts in, in minimizing the carbon footprint, for instance, uh, by serving only uh, vegetarian meals at the conference. I hope that these choices will be succeeded also in, in future conferences, by future conference organizers. But let's pay attention to the housing issues now. And Nadia, you already mentioned quite a lot of them. So the COVID pan pandemic, the instability in the Middle East, the Brexit, climate change, high energy prices, high inflation, and of course, the terrible war in Ukraine affects already the life of millions of people around the world. Yeah, the war in Ukraine came as a complete surprise also for many experts and also for the population of the Ukraine and also Russia. Many lives are sacrificed and many parts of the country, including many houses, have to be rebuilt after the war. Now, already housing experts are debating how this should be organized. And also the conference, in this conference in Barcelona, there will be attention for this urgent question. And a new working group of ANHR will start very soon on housing systems, homes and neighborhoods in the context of war, uh, crisis, and, and, uh, and that will start soon. And also, 
people from other working groups are, are uh, well welcome to, to put their input over there. But there are more housing issues to be solved uh, nowadays. Many countries are confront confronted with a higher housing demand than was predicted some years ago, partly because of higher immigration, by the way. And existing stock is becoming more and more expensive, partly because of bad insulation and high energy prices. And not accessible anymore for low, but also not for middle income groups anymore, especially in these bigger cities like Barcelona. So marginalization, segregation, affordability, are on most political agendas in many countries again. After decades of privatization, liberalization of many housing markets in Europe, housing is increasingly, increasingly commodified, partly through financialization, the expansion of the private sector, and it also became, housing became a real engine for social and economic inequality. Now this brings us also to the wicked challenge how to solve these problems and uh, where the majority of insiders highly benefits. So it's a political question from, from these unbalanced housing markets. For instance, the housing quote in the Netherlands, if you look at the Netherlands, for existing homeowners, it dropped and it was only 60%, lowest in ever in history. But because of the huge shortages and high prices, young households have almost no entry anymore. They're earning too much for the social rented sector and cannot afford the high prices in the owner-occupied sector anymore. Now, the group of outsiders, like people entering into the bigger cities, youngsters, low- and middle-income groups, asylum seekers, labor migrants, divorced people, people in emergency accommodation, pay the highest price of dysfunctioning of our housing markets. While this unbalanced situation with huge differences between outsiders and insiders makes it also very, very difficult for politicians to change this unequal situation. Too much efforts on this unbalanced situation and the next election they are out. So only brave and strong political leaders, I think, can change this uh, situation. And of course, also, there's also a big task for housing researchers in this. Make very clear what the problems are and how they could be solved. But besides beside housing researchers, also more and more politicians in the bigger cities are in favor of such policy shifts. The city of Barcelona is certainly, I think, a perfect example. The Barcelona City Council started an ambitious housing program to get more control on housing markets, to combat affordability problems and, and extend the amount of houses for low and middle income groups. In, in a few minutes, uh, this will be explained in this plenary. Also in 2016, members of the major cities from across the global launched the initiative of United Cities and Local Governments. And this declaration aims to highlight the common challenges faced by cities around the world, such as the growth of informal settlement, social spatial segregation, financialization, and real estate speculation. As well as the urgent need to put in place sound strategies for addressing these issues. Now, to organize this important conference, lots of hours have been spent by uh, the staff of the Faculty of Architecture here uh, of Barcelona and also of the Municipality of Barcelona and also by, by, by our two NHR members, uh, Josef Maria Montana and Montserrat Pareja Easterway. But I can say, finally, you are all here, the big day has come and yeah, we can open this conference officially. So very all, all thanks for all the efforts you, you did until now. I'm also very happy that the European Network for Housing Research is also in post-corona times alive and kicking and that the membership list is since shortly is also growing again. Not only because of these main conferences, but also because of the smaller conferences which we are organizing and also because of the work of our 27 working groups during the year. Um, now, the working groups are for sure the backbone of, of our network and with the help of the coordinators of these workshops, working groups, it's also very convenient for local housing organizers to establish interesting conference programs. And we will have a meeting with all the workshop uh, leaders this afternoon. Uh, I also hope that you, many of you will join our General Assembly on Friday, half past seven, a little bit late, but okay. Five new members will be on the coordination committee will be elected. You can still vote for this election by using the link which was sent to you by the Secretariat a few weeks ago. Um, well, I think it's time to finish now. I'm looking forward to a very successful and interesting conference. 
and wish you all a very pleasant, fascinating experience here at the 34th NHR conference organized by the Barcelona team. Thank you very much. Thank you, Peter. You don't know how much I share with you and your team these sustainability measures that you have taken, so thank you, because it's, there's no other way. Now it's time for Montserrat Pareja Isteway, ENHR Vice President and member of the ENHR 2022 Local Committee, along with Jose Maria Montané, ENHR 2022 Chair and also Architecture Professor here at the UPC. Welcome. Good morning, everybody. Uh, hello, ENHR members. Hello, members of sisters or organizations. Uh, hello, ETSAPs, ETSAP uh, faculty members. Hello, all. Hello, all participants. Um, welcome to Barcelona. Welcome to this conference. Uh, I am a sort of bridge in between uh, the local organizing committee and the ENHR. Uh, this morning I was just thinking, what should I say? Because I knew that Peter was gonna, you know, say everything. So what's, what's left? Um, and I thought about a, a popular Moorish uh, saying uh, that says that for having a fulfilled life, uh, you need to do three things. Uh, the first one is to plant a tree or a transplant, uh, to have a child or take care of your nephew, uh, or write a book, and write a book, or translate it. Uh, maybe a fourth thing would be to have a conference in your hometown. So I think that I am done now, really. I'm, 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 I have a fulfilled life. Uh, the thing is that this saying is interesting because uh, it's not about having a child or writing a book. It's about watering the tree, pruning it. It's about feeding the child. It's about educating it. It's about studying, educate, uh, uh, editing, and publishing the book. So the conference is, in fact, the beginning of a journey. For some of you, it's just the continuation of a journey. Uh, there is a famous saying that Ben Tanner used to say that there is life after the conference. So don't worry, <laughs> life continues. Uh, as Peter said, and as we all know, the conference is a place, uh, of course, for sharing knowledge, but it is also a place for meeting people, for uh, getting inspiration, for exchanging your research with others that are interested uh, in the same. I think that, as I was at one point, uh, you might get infatuated uh, with the conference, and in particular with housing research. Um, and I think that Looking at this uh, Moorish saying, uh, you have to take care of that. So I think that in order to uh, help you to take care of what you have learned during the conference, uh, you have ENHR. ENHR is a network that accompanies you during the journey. Uh, I think that in the, at the ENHR, you can find colleagues, mentors, students, projects, publications, opportunities, in fact, so there is a world attached to the network. I think that conferences are the cherry on the cake, but there is a lot of cake underneath the cherry. So I think that for ENHR, uh, it, it is a place to offer scholars the opportunity to engage mainly, to engage with others. Even during the pandemics, uh, we had the chance to be involved in different, in different online events and, and I think that it was a way to, to get connected. No? We, we all know how hard it was, but ENHR was there. Personally, ENHR means the world to me. I started as a new housing researcher, young at that time, <laughs> and nowadays I am the vice chair of the network and, and I am, uh, well, I am just uh, very, very happy to be here. As you know perfectly well, uh, today you are in Barcelona. Barcelona is the land of artists, is a land of literature, is a land of innovation, of events. Um, it is also a field for housing. Barcelona, 
as it has already been mentioned, does not escape at all from uh, this usual tension between the global and the local. Uh, Barcelona today is experiencing, as many other cities in the world, uh, a huge increase in rent, in rent and housing prices and uh, all the consequences that uh, this represents for uh, the people living there. Barcelona, as it has been mentioned, is also a laboratory for experimentation. I think that we are uh, lucky to have uh, a municipal government that is engaging with innovation and with experimentation because somehow uh, these kind of problems they need a lot of imagination. So to, to end, uh, I would like to mention a famous sentence or to, to read a famous sentence from El Quixote. El Quixote is one of the important books uh, written by Cervantes and it's, it's a guy who goes around uh, Spain, but he also uh, visits Barcelona and he says that Barcelona is a library of courtesy is a hostel for foreigners, is a hospital for the poor, is home for the brave, is vengeance of the offended, is a pleasant correspondence for, for the friendships, and in place and in beauty is unique. And he says, even though the events that have occurred to me that have been not of my liking, in fact of great sorrow, I am not sorrowful at all just for having seen it. So welcome to the conference, welcome to Barcelona, and let's have uh, an amazing conference. Now, Josep Maria. Thank you, Monse, and thank you, Nuria. Uh, good morning, and thank you very much for coming. <clears throat> uh, on behalf of the European Network of Housing Research, the Barcelona School of Architecture and Polytechnic University of Catalonia and the City of Barcelona and the City Council. Welcome to the 2022 ENHR conference with more or less 370 participants from 41 countries organized in 25 workshops. Many thanks, many thanks for coming. Uh, the coordination committee discussed our conference bid for 2022 in April 2020, at the beginning of pandemic, and chose Barcelona, highlighting the fact that the conference bid for 2022 by the two organizers, Universitat Politécnica de Catalunya and Barcelona City Council, is considered a serious and well-prepared one and accepted by the Coordination Committee. We have been working during these two and a half years within the global difficulties of the pandemic and the coincidence of climate and economic crisis. So we are particularly happy to be able to hold the conference on site again, the first time since 2019. However, we have proposed a hybrid solution for the plenaries and meetings. This venue, the School of Architecture, was founded in 1875, but with the precedent of a class of architecture created in 1815, more than 200 years ago. I would like to thank the ETSAP, the School of Architecture, for hosting the event. We are in uh, two different buildings, the older one from the 1950, the Tower of Sagarra building, the tower, and this building, the Coder building, finished it in uh, 1984, named it after its designer, the Catalan architect, Jose Antonio Coder, where the conference is being held. During the conference, the bar restaurant and the bookstore will be open as well as the different open and garden spaces around the bar and the library. <clears throat> we also have the new headquarters of the Barcelona Chair for Housing Studies on the ground floor of Sagarra Building, created last year and that has been working since January 2022. The chair, with the coordination by David Hernández Falagan and the professors of the ETSAP, 
has managed the exhibition on project and research on housing by the teachers and students from the School of Architecture created during last semester that you could see in the lobby of the building, of the Coder building. This Barcelona chair, uh, also Montse Pareja and Julie Ponce, that is there, take parts of this, are co-directors of the chair on housing studies, includes the four public universities in Barcelona, UPC, UB, UAB, and UPF, and the three levels of governance in Spain, the Ministry of Spain, the Generalitat of Catalonia, and the Barcelona City Council, and will be presented in the networking session this evening in the cafeteria. Finally, just to say that although it's no longer obligatory to wear a mask, except in the public transport, feel free to wear a mask inside, especially when there is, when there is a concentration of people. Well, we hope you enjoy the conference and the city, learn a lot, and make new contacts and friends. Gracias, Monse, Jose Maria, thank you so much. I'm sure this conference will be the cherry on top that you were mentioning of this great cake, which is the ENHR. Um, last but not least, now let's welcome Javier Buron, housing manager at the Barcelona City Council, who will address a few words to you and also share a lecture of the projects they are developing and implementing here in Barcelona. Welcome. Good morning, everybody. Um, well, I reiterate the welcoming to everybody, to all the uh, housing experts from all over the Europe and the world who are joining us today. And on behalf of the uh, mayor, um, uh, I wish you the best for this uh, conference. Unfortunately, she was not able to uh, be with us today due to uh, agenda problems. And probably, uh, I don't know, but it could be, uh, some of you, you are asking yourself why city administration is uh, engaging, is involving in the organization of a purely academic uh, Congress conference. And the answer for us is very clear, is that in the drafting of our new policies, uh, the academia inputs, they were key. For us, there were, there were three uh, spheres where we learned a lot and we used a lot of uh, uh, knowledge in order to design our new policies. One of them is uh, the, the Housing Europe Network, the network of uh, public, cooperative, and limited profit providers. The other one is EuroCities, the uh, organization of big European cities. And the third, not in order of importance, one of the, those three big influences, it was always the European Network of Housing Research. So for us to be in contact with the academia is uh, key. Uh, and we um, believe that the cycle between training, researching, and disseminating uh, knowledge, uh, it is very important and it, it must respond to, a real, to the real problems that are, fa uh, are being faced right now by governments and administrations and societies. And we would like to uh, keep collaborating with the academia uh, uh, in an open uh, spirit, listening to the society and producing uh, or co-producing relevant, applicable and proven solution uh, remedies for the housing challenges that we are facing. Um, and last but not least, in this particular uh, first uh, remarks, uh, I will reiterate the uh, uh, thanks to the uh, organizing uh, committee and all the people who were involved in order to be able to be right now here, all of us uh, together. I won't name the whole list. They know who they are, and they were uh, extremely important to this outcome. 
And, and again, I have almost the institutional obligation to say it, I invite you to enjoy Barcelona as much as possible if the storms allow, uh, allow us to do it. Uh, this being said, uh, I have the uh, task to explain to you uh, in a brief period of time what we are trying to do uh, here in the city of Barcelona in terms of housing policies. Uh, the material will be shared, so no need to go through all of it, but the structure is this. We are working with an inclusionary housing approach, uh, focusing on social and affordable housing. We are doing a great deal of things, or within the web, but we are doing a great deal of effort in terms of increasing the stock of social and affordable housing. We will go through some of the tools that we are using. As, as well, we are also uh, paying some uh, efforts in terms of uh, the renovation policies of the already existing stock. Over there, the uh, municipal, the city competences stop. And from that point, we are dealing with the powers, with the competence of other administrations, the regional government and the state administration. And we do uh, some things that have to be with the uh, regulation of the market that are in our hands and we lobby for other things that we wish that other administrations they will be uh, doing right now. And I, I hope that I, I reach the conclusions with uh, enough time because uh, in terms of um, academic uh, in, uh, exchange, I think they are the, mo the most interesting things uh, to uh, underline. The problem that we are facing uh, is not very different from the problem that other big cities are facing right now in, 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 the, in Europe and, or in the Western world. We went through two different types of bubbles, bubbles between quotation marks, because the first one it was a real bubble um, uh, connected to mortgages. The second one technically is not a bubble, but there is a disparity between wages and rents pr and rent prices. You can see those two cycles, those two, those two crises over there. We know already that uh, since the coronavirus restrictions, they were lifted, the prices, they are going up again. So the last part of, of, of the graphic, uh, the price goes up. And here you have uh, an, a striking figure for us. Uh, maybe in other cities, you are facing similar uh, uh, challenges. But rents, they have uh, risen three times more than uh, income families in the last uh, 20 years. And in Barcelona, 40% of the population will live in a, in a rental accommodation. The share is 60% ownership, 40% uh, uh, rental. So what is going on in the rental market, it is very relevant to us. Um, the approach that we are using in terms of changing our uh, housing policies is a mission-oriented approach. Maybe it resembles to some, of, uh, some, of, some theoretical work that is being uh, um, conducted right now, uh, we, don't, we don't hide it. We are in part following the Mariana Matsukato uh, mission-oriented uh, approach. Um, before I go into the uh, mission, which is to be able to have 15% of our housing provision at uh, social or affordable prices, and before I tell you how far we are from that uh, uh, aim, Let's go with the two main particularities of the housing system in Spain and also in Barcelona, historically speaking. The first one is that we have a really low percentage of social housing, um, and it, it has a, an origin, it has a reason. Uh, our model, it was oriented to ownership. The, 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 the administration, they were promoting ownership for many years. So we didn't build, manage, and uh, renovate a social and affordable housing stock because it wasn't intended. Over there you have also the, the big shift in the uh, tenure distribution. Uh, in the 50s of the last century, the big cities in Spain, they were almost roughly 50-50 between ownership and, and, and uh, rental. And that changed dramatically in the coming uh, decades because of this policy of, of promoting ownership. And uh, at the peak of the uh, previous bubble, the 2008, 
we were uh, close to that 80-20. As I told you, here in Barcelona, the situation nowadays is different. It's 40-60. 40 rental, 60 ownership. But nevertheless, the, the system was not intended for rental, for social, and for affordable rental. It was intended for ownership, and that translated to the, uh, to the uh, morphology of, of the market. As I told you, we have this aim of being able to reach in a few years, in many years, unfortunately, that 15% of uh, 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 housing stock. Nowadays, if we measure where we are, we have 1.5 of the overall housing stock, or if we compare it to the rental population, 5% of the rental uh, uh, supply. Uh, if you add uh, public, cooperative, and limited private housing to uh, rental subsidies, which is a policy that we are also implementing, we cover 17% of the uh, rental population. And a few years before, in, in 2015, that coverage, it was 12%. So we are growing, but we are still really far away from uh, our aim. What do we need? We need more supply, that's for sure, but we need a diversification in the type of supply that we have. We have mainly market supply with a very residual uh, role played by the administrations and the non-profit and limited organizations. This emerging model that we are trying to implement, as we uh, like to say, uh, uh, runs away from pure and single solutions. There is, not, um, um, there is not a shortcut and there is not a single ballot. A 100% public, uh, I'm sorry, private provision uh, model, we know that is not working because the, ma the market has failures. At the same time, a 100% uh, uh, public management uh, system, it won't work either. So we will have to do some type of mix. And our ideal mix, our pathway, will be one-third private, one-third public, one-third communitarian and commercial non-profit or limited profit provision. We know that we are far away from that. And also, it has to be uh, uh, accomplished in these two operational approaches, in new pro uh, projects and also in the existing stock. Uh, before I go into uh, the different methods that we are uh, using to uh, increase our social uh, and affordable housing stock, I will have to make some uh, remarks about uh, emergency. We are facing an emergency. We are facing... Um, force evictions uh, every week in the city, and the administration is very sensitive to this. And we have set up different types of uh, instruments, programs, and projects in order to be able to cope with this problem. The, the first thing that we did, it was to um, create an anti-eviction unit called CIFO uh, that uh, tries to alert as soon as possible from the upcoming uh, foreclosures and tries to negotiate between the owners and the, and the tenants uh, in order to uh, avoid those forced evictions. Uh, along with this, we have other, other capacities. Uh, the, most import, the most relevant one uh, is uh, a social emergency board, a, a, a different system to allocate uh, social housing that has to do with emergency, and that right now, as you see, is um, uh, suffering a lot of pressure because we have more people with the right already recognized that units available. And the other thing is that we are really um, uh, aggressive uh, in terms of legal counseling. This is a, a capacity that the municipality didn't have. Experts, mainly lawyers, uh, almost 99% female team of lawyers who um, uh, give counseling to owners, but mainly to tenants, in order to know their rights and be able to manage this situation uh, uh, as, uh, as, as good as possible. We are not hiding that this is a real problem, and it puts a lot of pressure on us because uh, whereas you are designing tools for the uh, mid and long term, you have to face all these emergency problems every week. So uh, it is very stressful. Of course, it is much more stressful for the people who are suffering the forced evictions than for us, but nevertheless, it's a really tricky uh, situation. Uh, how to uh, increment 
the size of our um, uh, action. First of all, we have to talk about the land and town planning, that's for sure. But before I do it, let me introduce a debate that is key uh, in the uh, Spanish and Catalan context, which is permanent affordability. When you have units that they are not being run through market rules, for how long those units are going to be outside the market? This is very important because we have produced in the last uh, 70 years in Spain 6.4 uh, million units out of a 25.5 total, which means that the production of that device co called HPO or VPO, Vivienda de Protección Oficial, is not a minor instrument. It has been a very aggressive instrument of intervention uh, in the last decades. As I told you before, mainly for ownership and mainly went into the market. Uh, so much that today, out of those 6.4 million units, only 350,000 are still social or affordable rental managed by the administration. So the, prop, the, 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 the legal debate about how to keep those units affordable for how long, it is very relevant. And there are four uh, regions for autonomous communities in Spain that uh, we have made changes in our legislation, and it is more complicated, but let's, let's wrap it up this way. Uh, they, are, uh, they, they have to be affordable forever, permanently. And there is a system, a legal system, in order to watch out that those conditions are uh, fulfilled. And it works, especially in, in the region that has implemented this system for, for the longest, which is the Basque country uh, that is running this system for 20 years. And recently we have implemented this system, uh, we are starting to implement this system in Spain, um, in, I'm sorry, in, in, in Catalonia. Why is relevant? Because you don't lose more units and the units that you add to the system, they remain there. So you are building up a capacity. This being said, and this is very relevant for us, the next thing is zoning. How, how, what, what legal obligations do um, providers uh, have uh, in order to uh, build a new supply? Um, we have two, 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 two goals. Is one is to increase the legal obligations, and the second one is that those legal obligations are not only for um, limited price ownership housing, but also for limited price rental housing. That part of that supply, by law, has to be social or affordable rental. Over there you have the percentage of, of zoning requirements that we have in the metropolitan area of Barcelona, uh, which nowadays I think they show uh, an avant-garde position. Why it is avant-garde? First of all, because uh, we have a 40% requirement 40% of all new units, they have to be vivienda protegida, limited price uh, housing. But 50% of that zoning requirement, half of it, they have to be rental. Which means that in Spain we have created a new category, vivienda protegida de alquiler. Uh, limited price housing only for rental. Uh, and then it's also... Uh, uh, noticeable because we have created also an obligation in the consolidated areas of the city. You, 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 you are obliged not only to produce limited price housing in new developments, in greenfields, you are also obliged to do it in brownfields within the city. And that requirement is a 30% of it. And the uh, administration, we have a preemptive right of acquisition. So we can buy th those premises in order to increment of our stock. Uh, here you have um, uh, this, this instrument. What we have done is a zoning, a mapping of the city. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, this, this slide is, 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 is not correct. I'm sorry, forget the map. <laughs> forget the map, it's not there. Huh? And uh, this is an explanation of that 30% of, of, that of affordable housing within the city. 
And the preliminary results that we are getting are these two. We are seeing an increment in the number of uh, affordable dwellings in, uh, within the city. This is undeniable. But at the same time, we are also seeing this, and I will have to translate it. Here says the mayor will find 17 companies for uh, infringement of the obligation of the 30% of affordable housing. We know that. We know that this is taking place. They are trying to cheat on us, and they are trying to uh, avoid the obligation. But uh, we will have to persevere, because this is very important in the following sense. We only have land for between 50 and 60,000 new extra units. And after that, the city will be completed. So the first two numbers, the first two obligations, they have to do with greenfields. And the third, it has to do with brownfields. And brownfields will be the future of the city, because we will be renovating, uh, refurbishing, uh, rehabilitating, mainly in the future. Um, well, uh, once that we have uh, spoken about uh, land, the next thing is uh, how are we organizing the provision of new housing? Uh, first of all, something very classic, old-fashioned, we are building, we, the municipality. Uh, something that is not that uh, classic, we are building with partners, and something that in Spain is not that uh, obvious, we are purchasing uh, properties, and we are also uh, giving incentives to the mobilization of vacant stock. Over there you have the change between December of 2015 and June of uh, 2022, we have uh, increased our capacities in a bit more than 4,000 units, and we are able to house a bit more than 10,000 uh, new, new persons. And th 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 that's the division. Roughly, uh, uh, half of it is, is new, new construction, uh, one third is purchasing existing stock, and uh, one fifth uh, is um, the collaboration of, with private owners that hand their properties to us for a certain period of time uh, by which we uh, run uh, affordable rental programs. Here you have a comparison between our sta starting point of the 10-year um, housing uh, program and the reality. We are, um, um, uh, our production is being uh, a bit inferior than we, what was uh, uh, intended. And also we see that there is a change in the sources of inc increment. We are mobilizing more vacant stock that we've, than we thought. We are producing, we, the municipality, more public housing than we thought. And other providers, other social and public providers, they are producing in the city less than we thought. Um, here you have some figures about our direct action. Those are projects undertaken uh, by the municipal uh, housing agency. One. We are, we are using 107 uh, plots of land and buildings to generate a bit more than 6,000 units. And over there you have the, the uh, black line is the average development uh, in the past by the uh, Municipal Institute. Uh, and in red you have uh, the objectives of the, uh, of the uh, housing plan. And um, over there, year by year, you have our outcome and as you can see, a machine that it wasn't uh, working to start it and to uh, increment uh, its space is quite complicated. But we are uh, gaining momentum. Uh, one of the tools that we are using is the industrialization of production. We have a program that uh, encompasses uh, 500 units out of those 7,000 that we are producing. We are trying to minimize environmental impact, reduce times, and we are doing reducing those times, reducing costs, something that so far we are not doing, and improving the quality and the uh, environmental behavior of the buildings. Um, um, we, th th this is a, a legal uh, theme that maybe is not that interesting for every, everybody, but we are doing joint uh, project and construction public tenders which is something rather controversial here in Spain, but is key in order to be able to uh, make collaborate the architects, the, the, pro the, promote, the, um, the provider, 
and also all the industrial companies. And we are, uh, to some extent, we are uh, uh, fostering the cooperation between private uh, companies in order to be our providers. And over there, you have uh, some, some pictures of the two first buildings that we have uh, finished. Uh, of, of, of the 12 that uh, are included in this program. Uh, this next tool, for, uh, we believe that is a game changer, is uh, um, an alliance with the non-profit providers of the city of Barcelona. We did three different phases. First, we did two bilateral agreements. They were pilot, pilot projects. Then we did two different public tenders in, uh, to, uh, in year 16 and 19. And finally, we had decided to do uh, a partnership, a framework agreement, with all the organizations that are representing housing cooperatives and foundations who work in social uh, rental here in Barcelona. We provide land in a leasehold for 99 years. We are aiming to that share between rental and cooperatives. We have a municipal returnal subsidies of that amount. And we are, uh, finally, we got the support, the financial support of ICF and ICO, which are the uh, public uh, bank institutions of Catalonia and Spain. Uh, the end is to be able to build something similar to a CLT. And according to the CLT uh, European movement, this uh, SAL agreement is the first uh, CLT uh, here in, in Spain. Um, one interesting thing is that 130 families, they are already living in, this, in these buildings. So they are living examples of what we can do at a larger, uh, larger uh, size. And here you have a map of the 29 lots of land and buildings that we have handed to the uh, cooperative and, and foundation movement. First the two pilots, then the tenders, and now, I'm sorry, and now uh, the first, the first uh, phases of the uh, SL agreement. This is going fast after a, a, a really tough period of maturing, and I, I will explain myself. The agreement, the SAL agreement, I'm sorry, the SAL agreement is only one year and a half old. But the pilots, uh, they are seven years old. So which means that you have to work with society, with professionals, with grassroots movements, with the neighborhoods, in order to be able to build up those capacities. Uh, and once that you do that, uh, you, you have uh, uh, pulled the trigger. So we, we have a great deal of hope in this mechanism, especially because last July, as I, as I was telling you before, we signed the agreement with these two public banks and we have guaranteed 140 million euros to finance uh, 1,000 units. So let's, keep, let's, let's, let's bear in mind this first game changer, according to us, uh, non-profit public-private alliance, a stable alliance. The second win, uh, game changer, which is completely different, even though it aims to very similar things, uh, is uh, a public-private uh, equity company that we have created uh, between the metropolitan area, uh, the metropolitan administration, the city, and two private companies that they were selected through a long, long, long public tender. Uh, the result is this company with total parity in rights and obligations. This is very important. We provide with land in, in leasehold, uh, but other than that, equity, benefits, loss, dividends, all they are shared 50-50. And this is important because we, are, we, we, we were able to attract core capital, private capital that has a long-term uh, vision. And we have all the guarantees and securities that in the future no one will be tricked because if the project goes, well, goes very well, 50% of the dividends, they will be uh, public. And if it goes really bad, 50% of the blame, and I will be uh, 
fire, I suppose, 50% of the blame, it will be assumed by the public administration. 4,500 uh, units as, as the first objective, objective, sorry, eight euros per square meter as um, the rental price. Um, and the uh, good faith non-performing units, they are covered by the administration, by the, by the social service uh, 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 departments of the, uh, of the two different administrations. Uh, I didn't underline that Cebasa is a company, a local company, specialized in um, limited rental management, limited rental price management, and that Neynor is, I don't know if the first or the second uh, real estate company in Spain, both of them, they are public because they uh, are in the st uh, uh, stock market. And for us, it's important that not only grassroots movements work with us in bottom-up projects, which is very relevant. At the same time, we are being able to reach agreements with big commercial players in order to uh, uh, include them in our strategies. Uh, this company will uh, start the first constructions on site uh, in, a few, in a few weeks, and the first uh, tenants, they will be allocated uh, at the uh, last trimester of uh, 2024. As I told you, um, this is not that uh, um, frequent in the Spanish landscape, which is a purchasing program. Uh, I don't have time to go in detail uh, over it, but we have different legal uh, uh, instruments that entitle us to match the price of transactions in the market and to buy those uh, houses and buildings in order to include them in the housing stock, in the housing public stock. And theoretically, some of these uh, provisions, they were there, but no one was using them. We have used them quite a few uh, in the last years. We have uh, acquired 1,324 units, and we have spent for, uh, 145 million euros, partially contains the capex, not all of it. And as you can see, there is some distribution over the city. The market didn't uh, expect this movement. They thought that our powers, they were theoretical. Now they know that they are for real. And this opens rooms also for collaboration, for conflict, that's for sure, but also for collaboration with some market players. As I told you, the third thing that we are doing is uh, we have a variety of uh, programs for mobile, mobilizing vacant stock, private vacant stock. The first thing that we did is we carry um, uh, a census in order to be able to estimate the amount of the, of the uh, vacant stock. It was way, way bigger, uh, way, way smaller, sorry, than it was, it was uh, thought. Um, and it makes sense because we are in a very tense market, so, so we, uh, everything is sold or rented. And I don't have to, to time to go through it, but we have one program that it is municipal and it's aiming to affordable rental by which we intermediate between owners and tenants. And then we have another program that is, uh, its goal is social rental, that is a cooperation with a non-profit organization, uh, the Habitat uh, uh, 3 uh, Foundation, by which they also uh, mobilize vacant stock. And I don't have time again, and I think this is the proper map now. Uh, we have a zoning instrument for uh, uh, short-term um, rental, the city has been divided in three, in three areas. The red area, you are not able to get any more uh, license, municipal permits. The yellow area is, a, is, an, is, a pla is are places where if, if one license expires, another one can substitute it. And then the green area is uh, opportunity land. Uh, this this PEWAT uh, zoning instrument, uh, uh, it has been a company with another capacity, which is that during the coronavirus, part of the short-term touristic accommodation didn't have any clients. And they engage with us in a temporary mobilization program of vacant stock. 150 units, and probably uh, this will be residualized or maybe it will disappear in the future. These are the total numbers of all the different programs uh, to mobilize vacant stock. 
1,570 units uh, before the summer. It's an increase of 200% uh, because in, 200, I mean, in 2015 we had 777 units, which is a number very easy to remember, 777. This is not working, and now it's working. Well, up to here, we were talking about stones, bricks, supply with housing. Now we are going to talk about subsidies. We also have a policy of subsidies. Uh, over there you have some figures. Um, it has been incremented in the last years, mainly due to the uh, implication of the municipality. Over there you have the, uh, um, the, the amounts uh, of money that are being uh, uh, provided by uh, the state government, the regional government, and the municipality. They are all over the city, and we know that this is the best uh, prevention method against uh, for, uh, forced evictions. Because all these families, uh, around 20,000 families that uh, receive these uh, subsidies, they are in a better economical position in order to avoid for, for evictions. This is a summary of all the things that we have seen so far. New developments, acquisitions, temporary mobilization of private units, and over there you have the result. In year 2015, we, we were able to manage 7,500 units. Nowadays, we have close to 11,000, which is an increase of plus 40%. And the forthcoming years up to December of 25, we expect a similar, similar performance, a similar behavior. And as I told you, the subsidies, uh, they are also very relevant. They have jumped from uh, 18,000 to almost 30,000 families, which means that, as I told you before, we are able to um, cover, work with, uh, help uh, a bit more than 17% of the uh, tenant uh, population. Uh, again, with some degree of increase in the last, in the last years. Um, the renovation policies, they are also important. Apparently, we are not talking about the emergency or social situations anymore. We are talking about the, uh, uh, the state of the existing stock. But uh, nevertheless, I have to say that is, for us it's very important how we have shifted these policies from general policies to targeted policies in terms of territory and also of social uh, um, recipients. And over there you have several programs by which we have been able to target those, um, those programs in some specific areas of the city uh, where the problems, the socio-spatial, socio-physical problems, they are, they are uh, greater, bigger. I will have to fly through the rest of the presentation, but let's say that here our competences, they stop and we are start almost lobbying other administrations. But we believe that data mastering is market shaping. This is, this is a socio-psychological market. And in order to be able to intervene in that debate, we have developed with many, many partners, with other administrations and with the four public universities, as it was referred before, two tools that are, apparently they are naive, but they are very structurally relevant an observatory and a chair. We need data of good quality and we have to use that data responsible, responsibly and we also need good analysis of that data in order to have uh, scientifically based uh, housing policies. And let's talk about the elephant in the room in my last minute. Uh, let's say that we are extremely um, successful and all these things that I've been telling you in the future, they double, they triple, or they go by four times. We are very successful and we do much more of this. We build, we purchase, we mobilize, and we, we, we give subsidies and we cover a greater part of the population. We are so far away from the aim that uh, the debate of temporary and exceptional uh, especially speaking, uh, limitation of the market prices in the rental uh, sector, it is an, an uh, unavoidable uh, topic. We used to have, for a very uh, brief period of time, a Catalan law stating a system 
very similar to the German one. And I don't have time to go through this right now. And the outcome of this uh, system that lasted less than two years because the Constitutional Court has declared it inconstitutional, it was an uh, increase in supply and a reduce in price. These are empirically tested uh, outcomes that usually they are against of what most part of the academia is saying. Over there you have a paper of some colleague of yours, but which is very relevant to us, but at the same time it's very relevant the findings of the uh, housing observatory. Be because it is a public uh, institution and these are, so these are official da data. 40 municipalities, in 40 municipalities where the law was implemented, the price went down 7%. In 32 municipalities where the system was not applied, the price went up a bit more than 4%, 11 points of difference. Uh, the supply went up with no real difference between those two types of municipalities. And we went up in terms of uh, supply to pre-pandemic times. Of course, the coronavirus was over there. Those two things, they were, they were, taking, at the same time. They were taking place at the same time. Coronavirus and the rent control. But we believe, and now there is a, a law being discussed at national level in the Congress uh, and includes some proposals, we believe that the system of temporary and exceptional in the space system of limitation of the uh, in, uh, increment of rental prices is needed in order to be able to build a system, uh, a public uh, and public-private uh, system. I don't have time for all the rest. Um, just to wrap up, we believe that we have to develop a system, not only a set of tools, that we are an emerging model and we don't have a long history record like other cities, but we believe that we could be to some extent a model for the emerging models. That model, as I told you, it is mission oriented which means public intervention and also private-public cooperation, but certain type of private-public cooperation. In the meantime, rental subsidies and rent control, they are key. Uh, some challenges, we need a state, a national scheme. We don't have it. Uh, mm, it is not enough with cities lobbying. We need a change at the, at the, at the national level. Uh, the more that you intervene at local level, the, the greater, the bigger that expectation is. And that triggers a very uh, perverse mechanism. You are asked to do what others don't do because you are doing something. Uh, the battle for land and development here in the city of Barcelona is very relevant because, as I told you, the, exha the exhaustion of uh, available land means that we will be fighting mainly for renovation and rehabilitation projects. And in order to change the morphology, the composition of the supply, it is very difficult because it has a lot of inertia. You have an already existing real, uh, real estate stock. And in order to change it, you need time and money. And uh, in this really constrained uh, framework is quite complicated. L lessons that we have learned, uh, a mix tenure approach, social rental uh, fosters stability and, and, and improvement in life conditions, private, public and public community collaborations are needed. We are specifically targeting at core capital, value add capital is not bad, it's needed, uh, distressed capital, uh, it is a danger, core capital partners are welcome in the city in order to do building, but also purchasing and renovating projects. And as I told you before, uh, evidence-based uh, policies require an investment in data. And finally, uh, some suggestions, I, some humble suggestions of how you and us, we can keep collaborating. Those are potential research areas in which we can provide you with cases of a study with this 1.5 billion euros uh, open sky lab that we have here in terms of implementing new instruments, programs and policies, uh, collaborative housing, uh, public-private partnerships and cooperations, brand regulation, touristic accommodation, inclusionary zoning, and health and housing uh, conditions. Maybe there are more, 
but these are the first ones that uh, come to our mind. Um, in the last years, we have received some prizes, which is always rewarding. And even the organization of this conference for us is a prize. It's, it's an acknowledgement of our task. And I invite you to the Social Housing Festival, upcoming Social Housing Festival in Barcelona, uh, the 22, from the 22 and the 20, uh, 24th of March. It's not that far away. And uh, thanks for your attention. And sorry for the four and a half minutes that I took of excess. Gracias. Gracias, Javier. Thank you so much. And thank you for these good intentions and interesting and necessary projects that you are developing and implementing from the Barcelona City Council. We give you all our support and energy to go even further. I know you are between people who say, don't do that much, and people who are saying, move even further. But we need that. We need you to take bold measures, even when there are obstacles or tricky situations. So thank you and go on. And I know you're really looking forward to take a coffee, to take the coffee break, but just give me a couple of minutes so I can share with you some practical information that it's going to be useful for you. Make sure that all of you have the welcome pack inside. You will find a reusable water bottle. Can I see it? Does anybody have it? You have the water bottle? Yeah, that one. So. We encourage you to use it and refill it as many times as possible to minimize waste. In order to do so, you will have drinking and refilling water fountains on the hallways and baths. Just make sure you take it everywhere with you, with water inside, because in the catering area, then there won't be no water. And you will remember me, but not in a good way. So please refill it and take it with you. Uh, we did that because sustainability, as we were saying with Peter, is a fundamental core and a fundamental motto for us. There's no other way. We couldn't organize a conference such as this one without taking into account its ecological footprint. That is why you will also be able to enjoy a vegetarian and vegan menu for lunch, reducing food CO2 emissions, soil exploitation, water consumption, and so on. In that sense, we also believe in and want to promote the use of public transportation. So you can go by bus, train, metro, wherever you want of the city, you will find actually a 10 ride ticket in your welcome pack. It's called T Casual, and you can use it anywhere. Obviously, if you want to go somewhere uh, to some of the field trips that are going to take place tomorrow, make sure you don't lose it. And in that sense, we also decided not to print any paper programs. So feel free to check any information about the conference on the website, which will be always updated. Um, what else? Yeah. All plenary sessions will take place here, will be held here in the auditorium. For workshops, you will move to the classrooms. Beware that there are over 20 different classrooms, some of them are here on the basement, on the right and left-hand side corridors, and there are more on the upper level, on the ground floor, we could say, right? Um, so make sure you know which kind of, what kind of classroom you have to go to for each of the workshops. Uh, lunch and coffee breaks will take place in the backyard catering area if the weather allows us to do so. It seems that today, by for now, maybe we're going inside and you will find the catering area on the right. Just when you leave the auditorium, you will find stuff that will lead you and show you the way. And uh, you can use our Wi-Fi anytime you want. There are the passwords on the walls. And if you have any further questions, you can always go to our staff on the entrance and they will be pleased to help you. Now let's go take a coffee break, get to know each other, and we will be back here, we should be back here at 11.45 for the first plenary session of the day. Um, thank you all and see you in a while. Gracias.